<laughs> hello hello everybody welcome back this is just a very quick video on yeah the first you know few <laughs> connect them harmonics very speculative and relevant for meditation you know before we get into it the quality of the day is nautica voyage and uh, i am a fan of this perfume it's very cheap relatively speaking and um thanks to Eliade, who's uh volunteering for qri and is going to be helping us actually yeah um package perfumes uh and quality exploration more broadly um of the scent variety um yeah there's a uh gas chromatography of these uh, available online so you can actually know exactly what it's in this perfume and it's a lot of musks um definitely has kind of these low frequency super smooth vibe a lot of like citrusy uh kind of like scents definitely you know heavy on the lina lila acetate lina lol kind of a lavender component and dehydromyrcinol which is a uh, very common in colognes you know in some sense this is a very generic perfume but as a gestalt it definitely has a very unique flavor um I'm going to say that if you're looking for a safe Christmas present uh, to somebody who is just getting started in kind of like the journey of making sense of the state space of consciousness, this is a very interesting and worthwhile perfume to gift because, yeah, if, if, if they don't like it, they probably are not going to like a whole lot of other perfumes. And um, I think it's very nice. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about kind of the psychological effect that actually looking uh, at a presentation given by Joanna Cabral um, on the Center for Eudaimonia essentially had on my meditation experience. So this is pursuing the same line of research that, you know, Selen Atasoy uh, started in 19, in 2016. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, later on, uh, essentially applied it to like modeling both dissociative and psychedelic states of consciousness uh, and anesthetics, you know, with a very broad pattern that psychedelics seem to enhance the amplitude and power of the high frequency harmonics of your brain, whereas anesthetics seems to actually do the opposite, kind of like boost the low frequencies and reduce the amplitude on the high frequencies, you know, there's a number of ways of computing this and the literature still, you know, kind of like shows uh, innovative ways of doing this. But, you know, the first approximation, we're talking about a analysis pipeline that first images the geometric structure of the brain and then transforms that into a graph uh, data structure. And then it applies something like the eigenmodes of the Laplacian of that graph, which gives you the resonant modes of the graph in a way um, and then reconstruct brain activity as a function of kind of like a weighted sum of these resonant modes well arguably you can do this with any graph in graph signal processing and you know any signal on a graph can be decomposed as a weighted sum of its the eigenmodes of the Laplacian and in some sense, it's just kind of like a different way of visualizing the same data. Uh, you can think of it as like you know, the Fourier transform of a signal. You know, it's another way of looking at the same information. Um, that said, if, you know, you take the Fourier transform <laughs> of a signal and you see, oh, there's a very clear peak at 10 hertz. And there's another very clear peak at 15 and 23 hertz and 30. And that's it, right? It probably has something to do with yeah frequencies and resonance and periodicity rhythmicity because if it's just a random signal you know the Fourier spectrum would actually show completely random as well right it's like oh white noise or something like that there's just no pattern in there um, well the same happens when you analyze brain data from this connectum kind of harmonic paradigm hey it turns out that a lot of the variance is explained by a few of these connectum harmonics, um, relatively a few, you know, we're talking about like between dozens and, you know, hundreds at most, but still, <laughs> that's still a huge compression 
on the actual kind of like activity data that you're getting and you're able to represent, capture a lot of the variance. Um, I want to, you know, highlight that Joanna's presentation that, that you're linking in the description, it's mind blowing because it's kind of like a step up when it comes to resolution of the imaging in two fronts at once. So first of all, um, you know, they're analyzing a smaller brain, which is just like a rodent. They're analyzing a slice, you know, as opposed to the whole brain. And they're doing it with a 9.4 Tesla fMRI, which is a super, super, super powerful fMRI. You know, high-end fMRIs tend to be something like seven Tesla. So this is, you know, it's over nine Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a really powerful fMRI. And, um, you know, they actually tried to model the resonant modes of the whole brain, uh, but then kind of like apply those predictions to just the activity that they see in the slice. And, you know, the empirical data matches the predictions super well. Not only that, just like visually, you know, this is a level of definition where you can actually visually recognize, oh, yeah, yeah, there's a few harmonics there and they're kind of in a superposition is like it's essentially becomes visually obvious at that level of resolution just looking at a slice and seeing that presentation really renewed my faith in like oh my gosh actually yes you know i've talked about this theoretically but it has been before to where all i could really say is hey you know trust me <laughs> if you run the statistics on this fmri data there are harmonics in there. You can't see them because there's something that happens at the statistical level. You know, it is something kind of a gravitational lensing and, um, you know, like, um, yeah, re recordings of the sky, you know, like telescope uh, measurements. It's like, yeah, it's something that happens statistically, but it's very difficult to point to a particular place and say, hey, here is some lensing. Unless, you know, you do something like the Hubble deep field, uh, you know, photograph, and then you can actually see some gravitational lensing. I feel it's something like that with kind of this single slice in a rodent. It's like high enough definition that, oh my gosh, you can actually visually recognize the harmonics. And, you know, the very, very first harmonic is the global mode. And that is just kind of in, out, in, out, in, out. <laughs> You're just strobing, you know? The whole system just strobing. I suspect, you know, 5-MeO DMT um, probably is activating the global mode. No structure other than just yes, no, yes, no, <laughs> yes, no. Interestingly, though, the next two harmonics were something that could be essentially identified with the respiration and heartbeat. Very much so, you know, like the ball signal in fMRI you can see the activity just go up with the heart and kind of like refresh the blood of the brain. <laughs> but then also with respiration. Okay, seeing that, again, it renewed my faith in connectum harmonics, but oh my God, like all of a sudden I kind of understand what's happening with, uh, you know, breath work and, and meditation focused on breathing that a lot of the states that you're accessing by carefully kind of like timing in a coherent way your breathing and your heartbeat, for example, at a rate of approximately six heartbeats uh, for every breath, if you interlock that and you kind of like maintain the phase locking between these resonant modes, it's sort of like a tuning into a particular affective key signature or scale. Like it, it really feels like that. And the longer you can maintain it, the deeper you can go into kind of the non specific non-linear oscillations that come from those two interlocking harmonics. And on top of that, you have a lot of other structure that is kind of like built on top of that stack effectively. I think it's very worth kind of like really taking seriously. You know, every time that you breathe, you have this kind of oxygenation wave, you know, sensitize yourself to it and, and, and track it and notice how it interacts with your heartbeat and, and how it interacts with your vasculature more broadly. I think, I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit in here. You know, I was writing also recently <laughs> kind of like speculating that like, Hey, potentially a very 
awesome, you know, secular, transparent, uh, effective, no BS type of meditation program would be around identifying the phenomenology of the first 20, let's say, connectum harmonics, learning how to instantiate it, you know, each of those separately, at first with, you know, neuromodulation or external input, either body vibration, audio, you know, light stimulation or substances, um, gentle, gentle substances, nothing extreme, uh, you know, something like L-thanine, <laughs> you just like very, very basic, you know, very, very, very uh, subtle things. And, you know, things such as like food, which kind of food you eat may, for example, differentially affect, you know, the first third or seventh harmonic as a function of the type of dynamic that it will kickstart in your gastrointestinal system. Yeah, yeah, I suspect actually those are important too, you know, and like the mood is different after you eat. It depends on what you eat. The amount of, you know, like serotonin <laughs> that is implicit in the food that you eat. Um, you eat, you know, three bananas in an empty stomach that does something to your gastrointestinal, you know, system that is felt in terms of specific patterns of vibration. I think that probably would, yeah, be highlighted with this analysis. You know, and in terms of, yeah, like neurostimulation, like one of kind of like the very low frequency harmonics is kind of like this wave that does this, is like going up and down in the somatosensory cortex. My sense is that, you know, if you're actually in a body suit <laughs> that allows you to compress any given part of your body and you do it kind of like in a body scan type of way, kind of this like rhythmic up and down, and you do it just right with the right temporal frequency and the right phase, I think you can very likely, you know, activate that one resonant mode in a very, very strong way. And the same with like stroboscopic stimulation, you know, like the harmonics up to something like, yeah, number 10, 12, and so on. They have like a, a high loading in the, in, in the visual cortex. The default mode network uh, might be, you know, modulated by uh, uh, two or three of these harmonics. Um, I would strongly suspect that the right combination of light, sound, and body vibration can in a very standardized way uh, for each individual reliably activate you know, an individual of one of these harmonics and getting familiar with what it feels like. It's kind of like giving you the, the atoms <laughs> of your vibratory, you know, repertoire, which is the building blocks of your mood and, 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 and the texture, the texture of your world simulation. Very, very, very based on feeling and, and the patterns of vibration and tension and, and release. That is happening in the in the somatic field as a consequence of this superposition of waves. Um, but then on top of that, I think you know what the program could very much be about is learning to um, put some of those harmonics in phase, you know, and in coherence with one another, purifying them in a way. Um, and so you could probably neatly characterize some states of consciousness like let's say the third jhana in terms of hey this is all of the you know even harmonics up to like the 12th you know when you have like that stack maybe actually that is the the third jhana especially with a particular energy distribution uh between them you know i'm i'm, I'm also generally kind of like thinking in this direction because you know very high quality phenomenological accounts of the various jhanas, you know, and I can access the early versions of them, but, you know, there's such a thing as a hard jhana, just like as intense, you know, as a DMT trip, but just from meditation, where, yeah, people like Daniel Ingram in mastering the core teachings of the Buddha, and, you know, also talking to him in person, but yeah, people of that caliber, they will say things along the lines of, hey, the second jhana has coherence in the center, but you kind of diffuse incoherent waves in the periphery. Whereas the third jhana tends to be very coherent in the periphery, but yeah, kind of like out of phase and flickery, you know, in the center. And then finally, the fourth jhana is when these two kind of like rings, the center and the surround actually harmonize with each other. Okay, this is also the sort of thing that just completely naturally emerges when you're playing around with software. 
that looks at the combination of resonant modes, let's say in a Cialdini plate, just as an example. Um, and actually, you know, soon I'm going to be showing a lot more of those uh, simulations. The reason I'm not showing you right now actually is because I'm crafting a study that is going to be using some of that stimuli. And so I don't want to put it online before, you know, we collect some data on whether people's, you know, actually, yeah, like first first, first uh, impressions and reactions to, to those particular simulations that are trying to uh, effectively simulate the flow of attention as a function of, you know, weighted sums of coherent or incoherent uh, harmonic resonant modes. Um, yeah, very exciting stuff. But yeah, no, I think very low hanging fruit in a sense, but oh my God, it's gonna give us like a solid foundation upon which to build a secular, transparent, ethical, you know, actually effective meditation system. You don't need to take uh, anybody's word for it. Ideally, it's something that, hey, is going to be <laughs> as scientific as like tuning a, you know, musical instrument. <laughs> you don't need a shaman, you know, to, to tune a piano. So why do we need a shaman to tune a human, you know, body system? Probably it comes down to math and 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 good and good biology. So um, with that, well, Merry or happy Thanksgiving to those who celebrate. I think gratitude is very important and I'm insanely grateful to all of you guys <laughs> who've been following me uh, for a while or yeah, even if you're just looking at this video that you've never seen me in, my, in, in the entirety of your life. Still, uh, a lot of gratitude uh, and thank you for all of your insightful comments and um, interesting emails. <laughs> all right, with that, infinite please everybody. Take care, see you another time. I'll talk to you about a different topic on another time. <laughs> Take care. Ciao.